Welcome to One More Round with Josh Norris. I'm very excited to have my good friend Danny Brown with us today. He's the CEO and founder of Myriad Real Estate, and uh, we're going to get into a lot of good stuff and, uh, about the economy today. But I want you to, to make sure as you're uh, listening to this, like, comment, subscribe to the channel because this is the kind of information we want feedback on. Um, and I know you're going to get a lot of great stuff today. So welcome, Danny. Thanks for having me, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. God, I feel like I haven't seen you in forever. I know. It has been a while. Somebody we're... decided to get sick. and you know. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you're back up on your feet. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, yeah, it's good to see you back at the gym because I know how important that is to your life and, and mine, too. Right. So I, would, I wouldn't know what to do if... Uh, if my legs were taken out from under me for a long period of time. Like yeah, that, so. that, it was one of the harder parts is not going to the gym because that's what keeps me from like being crazy. Right, me yeah. too, yeah. yeah. It's like my way to get rid of stress and kind of stay even. And if I don't get to go to the gym for a few days, I'm a little like wired and my wife is just even like, you need to go to the gym, like get out of here. <laughs> right, yeah, go, so I already went today, it's all right. Just, yeah. go, just go back, go just leave. Yeah, <laughs> I do legs or something. Yeah. Um, well, so a lot of people don't know how long, we've known each other a long time, 15 years or so, met when I was at Pure Fitness and uh, Danny was working out and always been into that. And it was it was cool because uh, we reconnected, um, I don't know, six, seven years later at Trust Egrity mm -hmm. and neither of us knew at the second. And Trust Egrity is a cool group for those of you guys who don't know. Um, it is a group of individuals of different, uh, basically different industries and it's a more of a white collar type networking. I think mm -hmm. you said that one time and I've always adopted it. Well, what I remember about that is uh, being literally the youngest people in the room by a decade minimum and uh, being a little intimidated. So when I identified somebody that's like similar in age, I'm like, oh my God, thank God. And then happened that we knew each other. Yeah, I remember uh, like the very first meeting we both get on the elevator, not really knowing what we're walking into. And I was like, I think I know you. And you're like, I think I know you too. And then we kind of pieced it together because it had probably been, what, a 10-year gap, five, 10-year yeah, yeah, gap yeah. that um, we had seen each other. And it was not like we were buddies at the gym. It was just right. you go to the gym kind of at the same time and mm -hmm. you start seeing familiar faces. Yeah, that's and it. Yeah, yeah. So it's really funny how the world works and uh, uh, getting reconnected. So yeah. I'm super thankful for that. Yep. And then it's been such a great group to be a part of. I mean, over the years, because we were so young, I mean, I feel like it was nice being able to get the knowledge from people that were in, in different industries, but also experts there. So, I mean, even, gosh, it's been, I think, eight years or so since we've been in it. Yeah, we were founding members. And, and you know, my advice to any young people that might be watching this is that, especially as we head into tough economic times, um, networking becomes super crucial. Mm -hmm. And putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations is really important. And I really am thankful to that group because I have met people who are much more my senior, still are obviously, but that I would never have met. Like I would never have come in contact with some of these individuals ever because they were so far outside my sphere of influence, my network, and they've had just such a huge positive experience on my development as a leader and a business owner, um, you know, just different uh, referral sources, which is ultimately, you know, the whole reason that we joined was to get referrals. But the, the benefits outside of that really outweighed the initial uncomfortableness that existed. So, you know, that networking part of it was really important to me in the early years of developing my business. Absolutely. Well, and it, it um it's that piece of it's huge and I feel like now it's been so long we've developed relationships with these people that you know aren't gonna go away and they're they're people that we can you know work with and bounce ideas off of and and that's that's huge so like you were talking about with young people I think that's something that we did right which was get into that kind of stuff early um, which is paid Pay dividends. I mean, getting free advice from attorneys is always like, you know, yeah. I mean, they typically charge several hundred dollars an hour, right? right? And you and I can get, pick their brains. Mm -hmm. We don't take advantage of it, but we can get free uh, information from them that I think otherwise would probably be charged. So that right there is kind yeah. of worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, you've been in real estate now for how long? Uh, so I got my real estate license in 2007. Okay. So right as the real estate market was crumbling, uh, due to the you know the great recession that happened kind of it really started in 05 but kind of peaked and everybody talks about 07 08 because uh, that's when like the housing market collapsed mm -hmm. and if I remember correctly you were doing like a hundred some odd homes uh, 
at that point in time for really small dollar amounts per. Yeah. Uh, tell us, I mean, what was that like? It was a grind. Um, I wouldn't trade it for the world because I learned so much. You know, I, I'm a native to Phoenix and I lived relatively a, you know, upper middle class sheltered white kid life. Um, and when the housing market collapsed and specializing and focusing on bank owned properties, it really took me to a lot of areas in greater Phoenix that I didn't know existed um, for one. Um, having been in a you know sheltered kind of right. little bubble. We all are in our bubble, so this really took me outside of that and exposed me to all of the different areas in Phoenix that is still serves me today. And because of the sheer volume mm -hmm. of transactions that I was doing, and it was about 150 per year for like a three year period, um, it really made me a veteran in the industry very quickly and gave me the ability, you give me, you know, 10 minutes in the internet, I can pretty much value a property regardless of where it's at in all of Greater Phoenix, um, just because of the lessons and the strategies I learned doing the bank owned properties. But you're right, the values, the prices were so low. Cheapest property I ever sold, you know, I'm in my, I'm very early in my real estate career. I don't really have any money and I'm just grinding it out. And it was a $10,000 two bed, one bath townhome in Maryvale. And I remember joking at the time, I'm like, I don't know, 26 years old, the limit on my Amex card was 10 grand. Yeah. And I was like, I should put this on my Amex card. And my 40 year old self is super pissed yeah. that my 26 year old self didn't do that because I would have obviously had that paid off yeah. and it would be worth, I don't know, 200 times what it cost at that time, yeah. you know? So, and, and obviously the commission on it, $10,000 property is not super high. So you had to do those sheer numbers mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to really make any sort of income. Right. Um, but during that time, it also educated me on how to treat people because a lot of times it wasn't just going to an empty house. Some, some of the times it was, um, and I was grateful for those opportunities to get there and there wasn't a family involved, but I learned that a lot of these people got really taken advantage of. A lot of them were tenants and had no idea that the homes were even in foreclosure. Right. And so it, it taught me early to be very transparent with people, to be very honest because these are people's homes. It's not just like a thing that you're selling. It's, it's a home. It's where they create memories. It's where their kids are. It's where they go to school. And, and so it, it's, it's, it's way bigger than just helping someone buy like a pair of shoes, right? You know, so it it taught me early not to not to sell homes, but to actually help people, educate people. So I don't really view myself as a salesman at all. I view myself more as a an educator, a therapist from times, a coach, and really a, a financial advisor. I, you know, I believe that the greatest path to wealth in our country starts with home ownership. Um, and so those are the things that I focus on, not trying to sell people on individual houses. And I learned that through the terrible time that we went through in 07, 08. Which is, I think, uh, such a blessing, like looking back on it because you're drinking through a fire hose, but you're learning lessons that probably would have taken you a decade. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You were to compound of that in three years. And I mean, I, I don't say this because you're on here. I've known you a long time. I also like, I preferred my, my developer just got a house with you and super happy. And I know how diligent you are and, and, and how good you are at your business. I mean, but it's better to do things in a compounded way rather than, you know, 10 years. Yeah, if you think about it, your average agent does 10 deals per year. I was doing 150, Yeah. right? So that's, that really fast tracked my abilities um, and it was really trial by fire. Yeah. So, you know, you, you went through that process and then uh, I know, what's the main focus at Myriad? It's, uh, you, you, from what I, we've talked about, I know it's first time home buyers, it's that move up buyer. Um, what do they need to be looking at right now in, in an environment like today? Yeah, so we, we definitely specialize in first time home buyers. I've always had a pa passion for helping first time home buyers because I believe so um, fundamentally that Ha that wealth in our country starts with home ownership, right? And and that's how you really build generational wealth and really set up your family. So that's why I'm 
really passionate about helping first time home buyers to, to get them in early and educate them on why. Um, and then like you said, move up buyers are always really fun because it's a really complicated puzzle to solve. How do you get this family that is in this home right now that needs to sell this home in order to buy the next one? And how can I do that in the least stressful way possible? Uh, and ultimately, like I hate moving, hate it with a passion. So how can I help this family avoid having to move multiple times to reach their goal? Like avoid renting in the middle. Um, so that's that. That's why I like those. Yeah. It's nice also that you you know you're helping someone sell and buy, so you get two transactions for the price of one. But more importantly to me, it's it's solving that puzzle. It's trying to get creative to get that person from point A to point B. Are there any uh, like funny stories that come in that particular sector, the move up buyers, where you know something crazy had to happen to? get the deal done yeah well I mean it's 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 really thinking outside the box right so you know with the market that we have been in for the last two years and it's it's since shifted and I'm sure we'll get into that but over the last two years selling was was kind of the easy part yeah. and I don't want to say it was easy but uh, one of my employees mentioned to me that it was hard to fail right so you, you kind of put a sign in the front yard had a ton of people interested in the home, you'd get multiple offers, and then it was like, well shit, now where do I go? I need to buy. So we, I was like, well, if this is the easy part, let's do everything to get that ready to go, and then go home shopping. Let's flip it, and we'll, we will literally put the cart before the horse, and let's go find the home that you're gonna buy, because that is the difficult part. And so I had a very close friend, She, I've known her since college, and they, they were ready to um, get a new home because their family was growing. And she's like, but there's nothing out there for us or the stuff that is available goes so fast. And so we, she was the first one, we implemented this and like, well, let's go find your house first. And we got her listing ready to go. We had it in the MLS, but only I could see it. So it was uh, what they call incomplete. We took photos, we got everything ready to where all we had to do was hit the go button. And then we went home shopping. It took us eight months. It took us eight months to get under contract, got them under contract on that home, made it through the initial inspections that we were gonna absolutely for sure move forward on the house. We listed their home, got multiple offers, got them under contract the first weekend, well above list price as many homes were selling uh, like that during that time, and then make arrangements for them to stay in that home after closing for several weeks so that they can move at their pace. And then we end up closing on their sale, closing on their purchase, and we just flip the script, right? Because that's what the market was dictating at the time. Right. You know, other people we, that we've been helping, we've been utilizing some of the iBuyers, which are open door and offer pad, who are big companies that come in and wanna buy your home at a potentially slightly discounted rate, uh, charge you, you know, pretty much on par with what a realtor is gonna charge and then they'll allow you to stay in the home post closing so that you can find your next home or wait for your next house to be built. And during that time, those companies in order to compete with the multiple offers were making just crazy offers on homes. I'm sure some of your audience is aware of what Zillow did and they were way overpaying so much that they lost $500 million. Um, and so, but all the companies were doing that, right? Because in order for a seller to, to avoid going to the open market during that time, where they know they're gonna get multiple offers, they're probably gonna sell above list price, you have to make them a super aggressive offer to keep them from doing that. And so we just, we utilize the tools that are at our fingertips and are constantly on the lookout for new creative ways to help people. So that's constantly paying attention to what Silicon Valley is doing in terms of offering these companies. And I don't view them as competition. I view them as tools in my tool belt to help my clients. And you know, we technically realtors owe our clients a fiduciary responsibility. And if I'm not aware of these up and coming products or companies, then I'm not fulfilling my fiduciary responsibility to our clients. See, I like that a lot because there's two main points. Number one, you guys identified something that was different than what you had to do before because of the market. So I, I love it because like, yeah, let's go find your home because the second we put this bad boy on the market, then it's gone and everything will work out. Um, but second, utilizing new technologies and new products as you as you put it because 
if you're not open to what's changing, you get left behind mm -hmm. easily. And I think a lot of, uh, well, a lot of realtors that I was talking to even three or four years ago um, that uh, started seeing these eye buyers coming in, they were afraid of what was going to happen. And I get it. Everything new can be a little bit, um, you know, fearful. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, it's going to change with or without you. So you might as well figure out how to use it. I mean, those are probably the same realtors that would have been afraid of the internet. Like, right? Yeah. You know, back in the day, real estate was just a book, and you had you you had all the information and you guarded it in this book. And then the internet comes out, and they're like, oh my gosh, now people have access to this information. What is it, what, what is that going to do to the industry? Well. You need to evolve, right? Mm -hmm. You need to work those tools into your company. And if you don't evolve, you're gonna, like you said, get left behind. Yeah. Um, so you let's talk about today's economy. Sure. And right now it's- uh, it's Scary. It's scary. There's a lot of unknown. Mm -hmm. Based on what you're seeing, and let's give a couple of scenarios. Uh, uh, first off, if I'm a first time home buyer and I'm looking to get into a home, uh, do you see prices maybe going down a little bit at some point in our market? And I guess we're, so for those of you who aren't here, we're in the Phoenix metro area. Mm -hmm. So we'll speak specifically to that. Um, or is it just something they're gonna have to bite the bullet and buy it because it's still gonna continue to go up? So a really good friend of mine once told me that the best time to buy a home was five years ago. The second <laughs> best time to buy a home is now, yeah, I like right? That. And, and I am a firm believer and always will be a firm believer that owning a home is better than renting. Statistically, people who own are wealthier than people who rent. It's not the only path to wealth. There are other ways. You just have to be way more disciplined, right? So, you know, for example, renting right now is cheaper than owning a home. Um, and if you can afford to buy but choose to rent, what do you do with the, that extra money? Are you investing it? For most of us, probably not, which is why owning is better than renting because you're, I view that mortgage payment as a forced savings account where every month you're putting money into this asset, right? It's not a debt, it's an asset. You gotta change your mindset and be like, I am saving for the future, you know, 2,000, 2,500, three, like whatever your mortgage payment is, it's a deposit into a savings account because you're gonna get that money back plus interest. And, you know, even if you bought your home at the peak of the market in, you know, 2006, headed in 2007 and kept it, you more than doubled your money through today. And the average person owns their home right now between 11 and 13 years. So yes, it's a little bit longer than the average, but that return on your investment, it was more than double, even if you bought at the peak. And so what we're coaching buyers on today is could, I don't know the future for one. I'm also not an economist, but I'm a, a student of the economy and I really try to pay attention to what's happening. And so the, the, the real estate market is really easy to kind of break down and it just comes down to supply and demand. The reason that we went through the craziness of the last year is the supply of homes dropped substantially. And I remember when the market was crashing in 07, going to conferences and listening to economists saying, this is temporary. You've got two of the largest generations in U.S. history in um, millennials and Gen Z coming up who will eventually be starting families and want to buy homes. Well, we're there, right? Your oldest millennial is 40 and your average home buyer right now is 34, 35. So that generation is ready for home ownership. So that hit at really roughly the same time the pandemic hit. Um, you know, the government steps in to backstop the mortgage industry. Um, and we can debate whether that was right or wrong um, uh, another time, but they did. And that caused mortgage rates to drop and plummet, you know, down to the mid to high twos for a period of time. But, you know, on average, kind of around that 3% range. Well, that caused a ton of people to purchase homes. Um, so the demand kind of went up. We already had shrinking supply and that caused that supply to drop even more couple that with all the issues that we've been having in our supply chains, couldn't build homes, right? Pre-pandemic, before the supply chains were all jacked up, to build a home took three to six months. Well, now it's taking 12 to 18 months. So you're, you know, double, sometimes tripling the amount of time that it takes you to build a house. So all that is backing up, right, with builders. So we can't build our way out of it because we can't build homes fast enough. 
which has actually helped us today with the shift in the market. Uh, but, how, how so? Well, if builders could build as fast as they wanted to, and this is what happened in 07, 08, builders were building crazy fast and they overbuilt. Well, because we our supply chains were messed up, builders couldn't overbuild to keep up with demand. It really held them in check. And now that the market has shifted and that demand has fallen due to affordability, there's not this plethora of inventory that is just sitting there waiting for buyers, Makes total right? Sense. Okay. So we didn't we didn't necessarily have this huge flood of homes come to the market um, like we did in 07, 08. You know, that kind of explains what happened during the pandemic. And it's kind of like the Peloton effect, right? So what happened with Peloton is everybody was stuck at home, but they still wanted to work out. So everybody orders at home gym equipment and it skyrockets, right? Well, same thing with housing. We're all stuck at home. What we needed kind of changed. Interest rates are super low. And I think of myself as an example. My wife and I looked at interest rates, looked at the housing market and had a conversation. Is the house we're in the house we want to be in for the next 10 to 15 years? Well, the answer was no. So we're like, well, shit, let's take advantage of these super low interest rates and buy the house that is our next home, our home for the next 10 to 15 years. If it wasn't for the market and where interest rates are, we probably wouldn't have done that yet. So that moved up our timeline to take advantage of that situation. And so I know a lot of people that were in the same boat, like these interest rates are great. I'm gonna do my move now. So everybody kind of shifted and moved up like their process and their, their, their timelines. Um, so that led to kind of prices skyrocketing, you know, and again, in Greater Phoenix over the last two years, we've seen property values up between 50 and 60% in a two year period, which is insane It is and not sustainable. So fast forward through today, um, we knew that the Fed needed to get control of inflation and, you know, inflation has been caused by a variety of different things. It's not just one thing caused inflation. It, it's, it's a more nuanced conversation, right? But we need to get control of inflation. The one tool that the federal government has to try and do that is to raise interest rates and make the cost of money for banks to borrow more expensive. If you raise rates, and that's the rate, so when people say they raise rate, the Fed is gonna raise rates, it's not that they're raising rates on you and I, it's they're raising rates on how much it costs banks to borrow from each other, how much they're gonna pay. Now that does trickle down mm -hmm. and they start charging us to make up for that cost. So, you know, during the recession to borrow money was zero for them. So it was very low for us. Um, well, now the Fed's raising that, those rates and that's causing the costs for us to borrow to be more expensive. So that's putting the brakes on a lot of things. Um, and, and that is mortgage rates. So I have been in the camp and have been for, for a while that mortgage rates needed to go up to put downward pressure on demand because our inventory was so, so low. We had to put the brakes on that rate of appreciation in the housing market because it wasn't sustainable. Um, yeah, because there's all this scrambling that happens because you don't have the amount of homes to sell, the amount of buyers you have, and whether they're pre qualified or not, it's like, well, they still need a home to buy. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You know, everybody needs some place to live, right? And so these higher rates now mixed with higher prices has really impacted people's affordability. And so inventory has started to build. It's built relatively quickly in a short period of time because you've had a lot of regular buyers leave the market because they just can't afford to buy a home. And then you've had Wall Street who was buying a lot of single family homes to turn into long-term rentals. The Black Rocks of the world. Yeah, yep. uh, Innovation Homes, there's like a whole bunch of them. They've also left the market and are sitting on the sidelines. They're, they're not, selling homes, they're not liquidating their ass, they're just sitting there watching, waiting to see what things do. And so because your demand has shrunk, it's caused your supply to start to increase. And it's really important to kind of dial in what the supply of homes is, in, especially in Greater Phoenix, because it has gone up kind of quickly. Um, and it's mostly investors owned. Um, the market right now is comprised of uh, fifty-five percent of all listings are vacant, and of that fifty-five percent, it's over eighty-five percent of those have been owned for less than two years. Meaning that those are 
investor owned flips. 12% uh, of the market is iBuyers. Open door and offer pad make up 12% of our market. Another 12% is new homes. Um, and builders during the recession weren't using the MLS at all. So a quarter of our market is made up of builders and open door and offer pad, yeah. right? And so that is gonna peak because they only have so many properties. And we're starting to finally, I've been saying for months and I've been wrong for months, but I've been saying eventually the number of listings in Phoenix will start to peak. Well, that is finally starting to bear true and we're starting to level off. We're at about 18,000, 19,000 homes on the market today. Where at the, the bottom of the market, we're at 3,500. Oh my goodness. Right. Because in, in where we're at now is a healthier yes. yeah, place. Yep. So the healthier. real estate market, despite what you read on just headlines, is way more healthy today than it was a few months ago because rates are higher. Now, I think rates are too high and they peaked in June at 6.5%, which fundamentally the math doesn't work out. Um, and should be in the fours. And ag again, I'm being proven right because rates this week finally dropped back down and the high is 4.99, which is a little bit more in line with the fundamentals of how mortgages work. And I think that that, you know, we'll probably by the end of the year, I think end up somewhere between four and a half and 5% for mortgage rates, which is really healthy for the, the mortgage or for the, the housing market. That's huge. So it seems like, you know, I, I love your earlier quote. I mean, today is the best time to buy. Five years ago was better. But, yeah. Um, so it seems like it's healthy. And if it is a first time home buyer, they might not get the home that they would have gotten two years ago, obviously, with the money. It's not like they doubled their income right. in two years. Some some people do, but most people don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm making the argument right now that this is the best market for buyers that we've been in since 2014. We haven't had a balanced market between buyers and sellers since 2014. The, the pendulum has been firmly in the seller side since then. Institutional buyers, big investors have left the market. If you've been a buyer or wanted to buy a home in the last two years, it has sucked. It has been the worst because you're getting beat out with people from cat with cash from California. You're getting beat out from Wall Street. You know, you're competing with other people who are just like you. And you know, in life, there's, there's always somebody who's better than you, you know, at everything, yeah. right? And so housing is the same. So there's always gonna be that buyer that's gonna be a little bit better than you are. And so it's been really frustrating to be a buyer in the last two years. Well, today, you're not, you don't have that competition and you have choices. So right now we're getting sellers to pay for closing costs. We're getting sellers to do repairs. So we just closed on a, a home with a buyer where we got the seller to contribute towards closing costs. We got them to uh, give a credit for a new roof and the house had a solar loan on it and we got them to pay off that solar loan all with the proceeds of the sale because their value had gone up so much that they were okay with with taking from those proceeds to pay some of that stuff off to get their home sold so it becomes a win-win um, so buyers have way more power than they've had um, now than in the last two years. Which is huge. And you said so, you said 55% of the current um, houses on the market are owned by investors. What are your thoughts on now investing in the real estate, knowing that that is slowing down? Is it still something people should be looking at for um, their portfolio? On average, obviously that can be a loaded question, but what are your thoughts there? Yes, I mean, I think they should as long as they plan on owning the home for longer than two years. If an, I'm an investor and I'm investing in the real estate market and I have a, sh a short window, I'm probably avoiding it because I don't know what that supply demand curve is gonna do, right? I think supply is gonna level off, but I don't know how long demand is gonna remain low. So if demand remains low and the supply remains even flatter where it's at, you're gonna start to see, we are seeing price decreases, right? That's list prices. We haven't seen sales prices drop to where people who bought like last month are now underwater, but it could get there. And in the short term, people could lose, you know, if the market does, there's a difference between a correction and a crash. I'm not in the camp that thinks the real estate market's gonna crash because there's not enough homes for that to happen. Um, but it could correct and you could see a five to 10% correction where the property value does lose five to 10% in the short term. So if I have just a two year window, probably avoiding real estate right now. If I have longer than that, you know, five, seven plus years, 
uh, then yes, I think that you can absolutely still invest in the home because you get your pick of the litter. And I'm a big fan of the saying, um, you marry the, marry the home, date the rate. Most people are gonna end up refinancing, especially if you're buying within the last two or three months. If you are in the mid to high fives, sixes, with rates going down, you're gonna have an opportunity to refinance. And a lot of lenders right now are coming out with more creative financing programs because that is the pain point for most buyers is that monthly payment, not what they're spending overall. So there's a lot of great programs out there. Uh, there's a two one buy down right now where you get the seller to contribute 2% towards your closing costs. You buy your rate down. So if rates today are at 4.99, the first year you're in the home, your rate's 2.99. The second year you're in the home, your rate's 3.99. And then third year through 30 year, your rate is back at 4.99. I think somewhere in that two year window, rates are gonna stabilize and you're gonna get to refinance into a fixed 15 or 30 year. ARMS are also a good option. I know ARMS get a bad name because of everything that happened leading into the, the housing crisis of 07, 08, but they are much more consumer friendly now because of the creation of the CFPB, who kind of polices lending and financing. So they are way more protective and it's not, if you do a five year arm and you get to the end of the five years, your rate isn't gonna just skyrocket, it's limited. And it's a gradual increase to give you time to try to refinance out of your situation. Um, so there's definitely a lot of options out there other than a 15 or 30 year fixed. Everybody's been focused on 15 and 30 year fix because the rates were so low. Why wouldn't you lock in for 30 years at 2.75? I mean, right. it'd be crazy not to. Well, now rates are higher, so you've got to explore some other options if the affordability on a monthly basis is that important. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, it's a good time to buy. Uh, you said it's the best time since 2014. If you're an investor, you're watching right now, you're probably not plummeting a lot of money in there um, unless you're. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're looking to, to buy like a, a multi-home unit or a, a multi-unit home, um, like an apartment complex, that kind of thing, it might still be a good time because yes. you're renting that out, right? Yeah, that's actually what BlackRock has shifted over. So they're not right now buying as many single family homes. Um, they are buying more multi-family because that is still in vogue and still making good money. So they have just shifted kind of what they're purchasing in the market and they've shifted over to multifamily. So yeah, a, you know, anything fourplex is on up, um, still solid investments. Awesome. So, you know, that, that kind of covers the market, but uh, we'll go to marketing because yeah. that's something that uh, you, you and your team have done an excellent job of uh, since I've known you and you've put together a little powerhouse team. And I always tell people why I, I like, well, not only you and, and your knowledge base and all that, but I like the structure of your team because you know that you're going to get the same thing that dealing with you. I'm going to get the same thing if I'm dealing with Morgan or any one of your um, your realtors on the team, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but you guys put yourself out there on social media. You've got a good presence. How did you come up with that plan? I know you're you're recently part of a coaching group the last couple of years, but you were doing this a long time ago. What what gave you the ideas to be out there and and to do such a good job that you actually do? Well, it kind of started in 2017. Um, I wasn't super, you know, the name of my company's Myriad Real Estate Group. It's not the Danny Brown real estate team, right? right. So I'm not, I'm not the type that wants my name up in lights and needs to have my name flashed everywhere. It's, it's been very hard for me to get comfortable with doing that. And I'm sure a majority of your audience is probably that way. You know, most people are that way, right? You've got this fear of putting yourself out there. Um, and so in 2017, my team went through um, a big change. You know, I, I had started Myriad Real Estate Group in 2013 with a partner. Um, we had gone our separate ways. We're still really good friends today. Um, but uh, so I needed to revamp the team and become the face of Myriad Real Estate Group. And you know, I worked closely with a coach. I worked closely with Morgan, who's still with me and my COO. Um, and we decided to create a real estate team that is different than any other real estate team that's out there um, in that. And it's not revolutionary, it sounds like it is, but it's really just creating a small business within the real estate world, which is the revolutionary part. So everybody on my team, we're a collective cohesive unit. Um, they get paid salaries, so they're not commission-based. 
Um, they get 401ks, mileage reimbursement that cover the cost of their dues. We all have our individual roles as part of the real estate transaction that we specialize in, but we cross train so we know each other's roles and we're all working together for the benefit of our clients. So it provides them a much higher level of service. And so, um, you know, your traditional real estate team has your team lead, someone like me, and then maybe a couple admin people, and then everybody else is an independent licensed contractor, essentially running their own business within the team leads business. You know, the team lead brings in the, the leads and then farms them out to their 1099 contract employees, and then they split the commission 50-50. That's your traditional real estate model, and there's tons of those out there. Um, but ours is very, very different. And so that kind of all started in 2017. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we started our marketing too, right? So we had to revamp everything that we were doing then to gear it towards this new setup that, that we were doing. Um, and it really just started out with just doing it. I mean, it was super uncomfortable and super awkward at first. But now I have no, it's just, it's repetition, right? And I think Gary Vaynerchuk's the, I learned from him that the first one that you do, the first video you do, the first blog you do, whatever it is, it's gonna be the worst one. It's only gonna get better from there. And so just taking that with any new marketing thing that we do, this is gonna be the worst that it's ever gonna be. It's only gonna improve from there and it takes repetition. But you start and then you You just gotta start, time. right? Yeah. yeah, like video is super huge right now and it's not the most comfortable thing talking to a camera, but it takes repetition and practice to do it. And I think where people get really hung up is in the details where I think a majority of people appreciate more authenticity, right? Where you are flawed. None of us are perfect. We're not supermodels. We're not, you know, who cares, right? People appreciate that authenticity and finding your voice and speaking even to the awkwardness in whatever it is that you're talking about, I think will, I think people will appreciate that. So you just, it's just a matter of starting, right? Right. Well, and one, one of the things I'll elaborate a little bit so they understand what I'm talking about because, so you have Myriad, uh, we'll just use your Instagram and Facebook and it's very active and it's very, you know, home driven, but there's personality behind it. Mm -hmm. And then you got your personal profile and you personally branded that everybody knows you, that Myriad is your, your company. Um, but you show things from, Hey, here's some market updates. Let me talk about that. You, know, you show, hey, here's my workouts. You know, hey, I'm on vacation with Alyssa. You know, all you, you share your life, and I think that is is what um, a lot of people forget is that although it may be in your mind boring or mundane or whatever, sharing your life allows people to connect with you, and when it's on authentic, that just grows your your personal brand. I think it, I would say, do you think your personal brand is a big reason that? your business has grown over the last several years? Yeah, I do. Um, and it's a, it's a hard line to walk between promoting your, your, your business and then promoting your personal life, right? And so to try to balance that is, and I'm still working on it today, is a really hard thing to, to do. So you wanna show on the business side of it, you, your personality and some of your personal stuff and then you know, on the personal side, you want to try to bring in some of the business stuff, but not too much to where that it annoys the people that right. follow you that you're only about like that one thing, right? So it's finding this happy medium um, of promoting both kind of at the same time. Um, and I think that that's where working with someone like you um, that is a professional in marketing and, and has their, you know, their finger on the pulse uh, is super important. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, when it comes to like showing your personal stuff, I do think that that's really important because it's very hard to stay in. I try really hard to stay in touch with everybody, um, but it's hard, right? And so by putting that stuff out there, it's one of the best ways to stay in front of your database. And I'll talk to somebody who I haven't talked to in, you know, six months to a year, but they'll have seen all of the things and it, and it makes conversation a lot easier because they're, They've kept up with what you're doing. It fills in all the blanks you normally would have right. to catch up in six months. That See, that's huge. And I, I never thought about it that way. That's, that's a very keen uh, thought because 
the end of the day, yeah, if you're calling someone, sometimes you don't make those calls. You're like, I ain't got an hour to talk to this person. I want to, just don't have that hour. Right. But you know, if it's, it's you know, they've been following you and, and they know what's going on, it's sometimes just a 10 minute call and uh, you're really good at that. And I've oh, noticed, <laughs> well, I've noticed cause I've been a recipient of those phone calls yeah. and sometimes like, Oh cool. Danny's calling about marketing. Nope. Danny just called to talk to me, um, touch and base. How did you get so structured in making sure you're touching people? I mean, not in a social way, but calling them, you know, uh, you just gave me a book, which I super appreciate, uh, power of one more by Ed Milet and, you know, like little personal things like that, that you and your team do. How do you keep that going? And uh, are you so disciplined about it? Well, first it starts with a good CRM system, mm -hmm. right? I don't remember everybody's birthday. I don't remember, you know, all the important things that happen in their life. That's what a CRM system is for, to help you with those reminders. And so, you know, one of the things that we do is, is everybody who's, a, and, and we've broken our CRM system to not just people in, our, in, in the database, they're broken down by how important they are to us. So we've got, you know, VIPs. Those are people, obviously very important people, people that I really love, appreciate, would go on vacation with. They've either done business with me, referred business, or um, I just really like them. Mm -hmm. Then I have past client A's, who are people that have done multiple transactions with us, referred us business. B's are everyone that's done one thing with us. C's are people that have moved out of town. And then, you know, D's are people that for some reason, either we don't like them or they don't like us. You know, you can't be perfect all the time. Um, so we don't want to target them at all. And then it's, it's keeping notes on these important things in your database and CRM so that you can reference back to those. Um, and it's also utilizing social media. I'm not the only one that's posting about my personal life and things on social media. So we have, we look for those things and we target it. And I've got someone on my team who is focused along with me going through our news feeds to look for reasons to love on people and reach out and congratulate them. So we're constantly looking for, you know, events happening in their lives and it can be small stuff, right? Like, like a book or I had a past client that um, had a pool built at their home. So I, I got them the little Dunkin' Donut pool floaties for, for cups, right? It's like $5 and just yeah. sent them that. Congratulations on the pool. So it's looking, you know, you have to be intentional about it. And I think as a small business owner, it's very hard if you're trying to do that all yourself. So it's recruiting help and proper delegation and using technology again in order to get these things done. And, and, it, and it also comes from a genuine place, right? Like it's because I want to, I want like people, it's a, it's a lot to help someone buy a home. And there's a, there are 80,000 people in Arizona who have a real estate license. It is the second most held license next to the driver's license. So if somebody gives me the opportunity to help them with that, when there's so many choices out there for them to choose from, the least that I can do is remember their birthday. Send them a little, you know, whether it's a card or we send brownies, um, you know, those small little things. It's the least I can do if they are choosing me out of the sea of people who happen to have a real estate license. And, you know, again, just ha being intentional behind it, creating a plan. I learned early on, thanks to Morgan, because this stuff's not my strong suit at all. So again, it's proper delegation and knowing what you're good at. Um, that when we try to wing it, we fail. We fail miserably. We need to have processes in place, it needs to be tactical, and we need the help. Like we can't just, we just can't wing it. Yeah, well I'll tell you, you guys have done a great job with it. I remember when I was uh, sick, I think it was probably a month in, and you'd already reached out, dude, are you feeling good? And the next thing you know, I get a little care package. Uh, and, and it was awesome, it was like all the things you want when you're sick. Uh, and I'm like, that's super nice. Now. Other, some other people reached out. I don't think I got any other gifts. <laughs> you know, I was just thankful you didn't send me tequila. I think that's why I got you for your birthday. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be a terrible gift right now. <laughs> it's for when you get better. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. can't, can't drink it. Yeah. But um, no, you guys have done a, a great job. I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, guys, I'm telling you, the information that he was talking about on the economy with uh, the Phoenix market, buying homes right now, go listen to that again. There's a lot of great information. You got questions, put it in the comment. 
Um, I'll notify Danny as well. Uh, but thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. You bet. See you next time.